to today's delving to today's topic. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce you our speaker, Naim Jena, who is a senior researcher at Mapungubwe Institute in South Africa, member of the advisory board of the Center of Africa China Studies, vice president of the Denise Harley Peace Institute, and member of the advisory board of the World Congress for Middle Eastern Studies. As uh, you are already familiar with, today's topic would be the recent application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in the Gaza Strip, as it's formally listed in the ICJ website, or simply the, the South Africa genocide case, uh, case against uh, Israel. Um, and uh, the following interim ruling for uh, provisional measures as of uh, February 26, while I want to mention in response to the um, urgent situation in Rafah, South Africa requested last week additional provisional measures. So with that, I will give the floor to today's expert. And uh, Naim, you are more than welcome to introduce a little bit more about uh, yourself, your background. And uh, we are going to have a presentation of approximately half an hour. So I encourage you to keep your questions and comments for afterwards. We are going to have a, hopefully a very constructive and wonderful discussion. Uh, the floor is yours, Naim. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, thank you to all the organizations who who put this together. I know that uh, pro-Palestinian activities in various parts of Europe is not very easy these days. So uh, any European initiative on this is uh, welcome. Um, I don't need to introduce uh, anything more about myself except to say that I'm a South African, um, and um, and I speak from from that perspective. I was asked to speak on the ICJ matter and given a few questions, uh, about five questions, uh, four questions to speak about. Let me just warn you that the last time someone did this and gave me questions on which to speak, I was given seven questions and it took me an hour and a half to get through them. But um, I, I, I think I'll, I'll manage this one in less time. So let, let me start with this, that Immediately after the ICJ order was handed down on the 26th of January, there were two types of responses to the order, not in effect, but in uh, verbally and, and in rhetoric, two types of responses from the Israeli side. The one was the kind of response we heard immediately from uh, Itamar, uh, Itamar ben Gavir, um, a cabinet minister in Israel, who said that the ICJ is anti-Semitic and, and dismissed it uh, from that perspective. The other was, uh, was a kind of response that endures and still is, um, is, is how many uh, supporters of Israel around the world uh, portray the, um, the ICJ order of the 26th of January. And that is to say, to be crude about it, South Africa lost and Israel won. Why did South Africa lose? Because the court didn't order a ceasefire, um, and therefore Israel won because Israel is allowed to continue its war um, uh, on, on the people of Gaza. That's as simple as it is made out to be. That, of course, is not correct. It's, it, it's in fact, a, a lie. So let me, let me say why I think that that is, uh, uh, that is incorrect. Firstly, the notion of a ceasefire in those words was never on the agenda. South Africa's application didn't ask for a ceasefire, um, and the ICJ would not, anyway, order a ceasefire in a case where uh, one party to what it sees as a conflict, where one party um, is not subject to its jurisdiction. It just makes no sense for court to do that. Um, those who are subject to the ICJ's jurisdiction are state members of the United Nations. So Israel is, South Africa is, um, Hamas is not, nor is any other uh, resistance group in Gaza. PFLP, Islamic Jihad, none of them are state parties uh, or state members of, of the UN, and therefore the ICJ has no jurisdiction over them. So the ICJ cannot order a ceasefire uh, to one party. However, there is a, a slight difference, and that is that um, South Africa asked for the ICJ to order a complete suspension of uh, Israel's military activities, and the ICJ didn't do that. What it did instead was it ordered that um, 
um, that, that Israel should take all measures, and I'm quoting, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention in particular. So to take all measures to, to uh, prevent the commission of these acts, killing members of, uh, of the Palestinians in Gaza, causing serious bodily or mental harm to Palestinians in Gaza, deliberately inflicting on Palestinians in Gaza conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing, me uh, uh, imposing measures intended to prevent births with, uh, among Palestinians in Gaza. This is, this is the first provisional measure that was ordered. The second one, by the way, says, the state of Israel shall ensure with immediate effect that its military does not commit any acts described in point above. What are the acts that Israel must ensure its military doesn't do? Killing, uh, killing Palestinians in Gaza, ca causing serious bodily harm uh, to, to Palestinians in Gaza, etc. Okay, so this was what the this was what the uh, what the court ordered. Now it's true that differs slightly from from what uh, um, South Africa asked for uh, in its application. South Africa's argument is that uh, those first two provisional measures, as well as the, uh, the the fourth measure, which says that Israel must uh, ensure the entry and provision of humanitarian aid to people in Gaza, cannot take place without Israel seizing its uh, uh, military activities. Apart from these differences, and this is it's important to note this, uh, uh, realizing the, the kind of propaganda about who won and who lost. Apart from these provisional measures, in terms of everything else in the South African application, the court, court accepted and upheld every single claim that South Africa made. The court rejected every single counterclaim that Israel made. And that includes uh, not only the substantive issues, such as that there's a plausible case that there's genocide taking place, uh, but even the procedural matters about jurisdiction, etc. Every single claim, a counterclaim that Israel made was rejected by the court. The difference was in terms of these uh, um, provisional measures, and that's where, where, where the difference is. It didn't order suspension. It ordered uh, Israel to take all measures necessary to ensure that those things don't happen. Now, of course, the ICJ is the highest court in the world. Called It's called the World Court. It's the court of the United Nations. Um, its rulings are, um, are law. And there is no appeal uh, to, to the rulings that it gives. Uh, there is no higher court than it. However, it does not have the, the, the power to enforce its rulings. Um, it's not able to force any state uh, to abide by the rulings it gives. That enforcement uh, falls only on the United Nations Security Council. And so the court handed down its order on the 26th of January Israel, in not in rhetoric, in rhetoric, this is what they said, but in effect on the ground, they, well, one argument is that they did nothing. The other argument is that they actually stepped up their military activities. Every day since the 26th of January to date, uh, Israel has been murdering around 130 Palestinians in Gaza every single day. That's quite apart from its activities in the West Bank. Uh, there's been no let up in terms of its activities. There's been no instructions given to its army to stop the killing of, uh, uh, of Palestinians and its Palestinians in Gaza. It's not Palestinian civilians, Palestinians in Gaza. There's been no uh, attempt by Israel's courts um, as per provisional order number three, no attempt by Israel's courts to, in, uh, to ensure that incitement to genocide does not take place uh, uh, in Israel. Um, and so that continues by people such as Itamar ben Gavir and uh, Bezal al -Smot uh, Smotrich, uh, another minister. Um, and the court is unable to do anything about it. Um, the only recourse is to go to the United Nations Security Council. And we know um, on, I think, three occasions thus far since October last year, that when there were uh, motions brought to the Security Council, 
for a ceasefire that the United that the United States vetoed those, um, and it is uh, uh, it is determined to veto any such um, uh, any such motion that is brought to the Security Council, um, and therefore um, that enforcement is not able to take place. And so last week, when South Africa put in a new application to the ICJ, one might ask what what is the point of this. If uh, the six provisional measures ordered on the 26th of January have been totally ignored by um, uh, by Israel, what is the point of bringing another application? Well, for one thing, it's a it's a sign of frustration and desperation, not only uh, from South Africa but from all Palestinians uh, in Palestine and around the world, um, and from many other countries, particularly of the global south. And many other citizens of the world, including from the global north, like like I'm sure most of you sitting in uh, uh, in this room right now, um, this kind of frustration and desperation that something needs to be done um, is what lead what what led South Africa to put in that application. But the other, of course, is that ICJ rulings become law, um, and at a future point in time, that those rulings can be used. Uh, against Israel uh, in in a legal manner, and so while it it might not save a single life in Gaza right now, and particularly what we what we looking at is Rafah at the moment and the massacres that have already taken place in Rafah over the past uh, week or so, um, and the you know uh, impending massacres that Israel is promising, while it might not make any difference to a single life. In uh, in Gaza right now, um, in the long term, um, Israel can be held to account uh, on that basis. So the the application from that perspective uh, uh, is important, despite the fact that we all know that uh, the ICJ, even if it finds uh, in favor of South Africa's application and grants all the provisional measures uh, this time around as well, that it might not have any impact on the ground. So the question is, what will change um, Israel's behavior? Uh, Israel's behavior, which clearly is genocidal. Well, I'm saying it's genocidal. South Africa says it's genocidal. The ICJ says there's uh, 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 there's enough plausibility that it might be genocidal, subject to to investigation. Certainly, it seems that that uh, a big part of the international community. And I know when when Israelis say international community, they mean simply the United States, Canada, and Europe. Uh, but that not that is not the international community. We in the global South uh, believe uh, very audaciously that we too are part of the international community. But certain powerful members of the international community have taken a stand um, that is initially completely and fully behind Israel. Uh, more recently with some criticism. And I say with some criticism, despite, for example, the the comments the other day by Borrell, um, the, the EU foreign policy chief, um, about the United States and about European countries who sell arms to Israel. Um, these are words. In reality, what did this part of the international community do after the ICJ order was handed down? Within hours of that order being handed down, the United States announced that it was suspending all funding to UNRWA within hours on the same day. And it was followed by the United Kingdom and other uh, a number of other uh, countries, European countries. And now that list of countries that have, uh, that have suspended funding of UNRWA sits at 16, 16 countries that have pulled out. And that adds up to around 60% of UNRWA's budget. Now, UNRWA is the most, right now, is the biggest and most effective distributor of aid in Gaza. And so the act of suspending funding to UNRWA is a direct, a direct undermining of uh, provisional measure number four, which talks about the provision of aid. Because the bulk of the aid, even that coming from, uh, from NGOs from different parts of the world, in the thousands of trucks that have been sitting waiting for months uh, to, to get their aid into Gaza, 
the bulk of that aid is handed over to UNRWA to, to, to distribute. And so that suspension means that, you know, by March, UNRWA's activities could stop if that suspension is maintained and there is no additional funding. And so the distribution of aid uh, to a large extent, I mean, won't completely, but to a large extent could stop. But also assume there's a ceasefire on the 1st of March and UNRWA's, uh, uh, the suspension of funding to UNRWA means that it ceases to operate. That would mean that children, uh, the, the vast majority of children in Gaza would not be allowed, not, not be able to go to school. Remember that of the 2.3 million people who live in Gaza, about 1.5 million of them are refugees and are serviced by UNRWA. And so the act of suspending UNRWA's funding and threatening its very existence is not only undermining of the orders given by the, by the, uh, um, by the ICJ, but it is also an attempt to destroy, in a sense, an entire generation of Palestinian children. Um, apart from the fact that uh, the lack of aid right now means that uh, people, people are starving to death already, um, that diseases continue to, to, to flourish, um, and more deaths will take place, even if there's a ceasefire tomorrow, there will be at least hundreds of people who will die um, of diseases and of, uh, of, of, of the consequences of uh, drinking unhealthy water, etc., etc. Now, Rafah, which we're looking at right now, which is what the last week's application by South Africa is about, Rafah is a town the south of, uh, of the Gaza Strip, um, whose population was, on the 6th of October, about 280 to 300,000 people. Today in Rafah, there's 1.5 million people. 1.2 million of them are refugees from northern parts, uh, from, from north of Rafah, uh, from, uh, from the northern area, the, the middle area of, of Gaza, etc. Um, and this is, uh, this Rafah has become the last refuge, and I put refuge in quotes, because for more than a month, for about two months now, the United Nations Secretary General, the head of the World Health Organization, um, the, the head of uh, UNRWA have been saying things like, there is no place to hide in Gaza. No place is safe in Gaza for the past two months. But nevertheless, Rafah has become the last refuge of all of these refugees, uh, all of these uh, uh, displaced people from all over Gaza. And that is what Israel is now um, threatening to bomb. What has the rest of the world done in response, apart from suspending um, those countries that did, suspending the uh, funding to UNRWA? Nothing. Um, they all sit back and watch in real time as this genocide unfolds. A few good statements uh, from here or there. One or two countries, including one or two European countries that have doubled or trebled their, their contribution to UNRWA. But apart from that, nothing. Um, no one is taking direct action against Israel to ensure that this stops. And frankly, as long as the United States continues to support Israel in the way it does, which is politically and diplomatically at the UN and, and otherwise in other multilateral fora and elsewhere, and militarily, I mean, the, the, the UN has just, uh, the US has just decided to give Israel a, another $14 billion military aid package, um, which is what is, uh, what is used to kill people in, uh, in Gaza. And so the rest, uh, uh, much of the rest of the global north is doing absolutely nothing to ensure that this genocide is stopped uh, in, 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 in its tracks. Let me make uh, one or two points about Gaza before I end. Um, and um, I, I want to you know, try and keep my presentation to half an hour so that there's enough time for, for discussion and questions. And that is that I want to go back to, to the 7th of October, um, 2023, when a whole number of uh, uh, fighters, resistance fighters from, from Gaza, uh, broke out of Gaza, and I say broke out uh, advisedly, 
uh, Gaza for for the past 17 years has been a a concentration camp. Um, we South Africans know about concentration camps. Before the Nazi concentration camps, the British built concentration camps in South Africa for uh, for Afrikaners and for black white Afrikaners and for black people. So we know those things quite well. Gaza has been a concentration camp for the past 17 years. On the 7th of October 2023, um, a few thousand Palestinian resistance fighters, and remember that in terms of international law, Palestinians as an occupied population have the right to resist their occupation as a colonized population has the risk, uh, the, the right to resist that colonization. Um, and that right is granted not only in the Geneva Conventions, but in a number of UN Security Council resolutions, which means that it's part of international law. A number of resolutions that refer to South Africa, that refer to Namibia, that refer to Com uh, uh, Cambodia, Cameroon, and Palestine, granting the, the colonized population the right to resist the colonization and occupation that they face. And there's this additional term that comes up in many of these resolutions. Some of them say, including uh, by using armed struggle, some of them say by any, mean, by any means necessary. And so Palestinians have the right to resist their occupation, including through the use of armed struggle. That is, this is not to say that war crimes are, are, are permitted, of course. Um, war crimes are prohibited for anyone, state or non-state actor. Um, crimes against humanity are prohibited for anyone, state or non-state. And we're seeing that happening uh, for the past four months um, in, in increasing intensity in Gaza, but that's prohibited. But the right to resist exists, including through armed struggle. And so when the Palestinian resistance fighters broke out of that concentration camp, and uh, went into what is now referred to as part of Israel. For many of them, I need to make this point, for many of them, they were not invading Israel. For many of them, they were returning home. Let us remember that the town of Zderot is built on the depopulated and destroyed Palestinian village of Najd. The town of uh, Ashkelon, uh, Ashkelon is built on the uh, depopulated and destroyed Palestinian town of Askalan. The various kibbutzes around Gaza, uh, Kibbutz Be'eri, which has become famous since the 7th of October, for example, um, all sit atop about 22 Palestinian towns and villages that were depopulated and destroyed in 1948. We know that in 1948, about 700,000 Palestinians were made into refugees and 540 Palestinian uh, towns and villages were destroyed, uh, were depopulated and destroyed. Around 22 of, the, uh, of those were around what Israelis call the Gaza envelope. Um, Gaza in 1947 wasn't this little strip that exists now. It was a much bigger area that included all of these, uh, all of these villages. So for, for children of those refugees, who were forced out of their homes from Zderot or any of those other towns or villages around and ended up in Gaza, for them, they were returning to their, to their families' uh, villages and towns. Um, it's, it's an important point to, to, to keep in mind because it means that Palestinians' right to return to their homes still exists. Under international law, that right still exists. 1.5 million refugees in Gaza still have the right to return to their homes in Israel, according to international law. The Israeli attempt to shut down UNRWA is linked to this. They believe that if they shut down UNRWA, and they've been trying, if they shut down UNRWA, then they will ensure that the Palestinian refugee issue will disappear. And if the Palestinian refugee issue disappears, then the whole story of a two state and a Palestinian state and all of that will also uh, uh, disappear. They've tried on many occasions to make the Palestinian agenda disappear and it hasn't. And so let me end on this note about UNRWA. And I want to end on this note because I think that UNRWA is an extremely important organization. Israel gets given by UNRWA every year 
full details of every single member of its staff in the occupied territory, in the West Bank and Gaza. In Gaza, that's 13,000 people. Israel gets a list of all of those with their details. They're able to vet those. Israel vets every single foreign staff member of UNRWA before they enter, uh, uh, before they, they enter either Gaza or, or, or the West Bank. All UNRWA schools are overseen in some way or the other by Israel. Every single textbook that UNRWA schools use is approved by Israel. Nothing UNRWA does is without Israel's knowledge. Every single school's location, it's uh, uh, the population of the school in terms of its uh, pupils and, and teachers, uh, every single clinic, its staff, its patients, all of that information is fed to, uh, to, to, to Israel. So when Israel says, well, so many of your people are terrorists, etc. cetera, um, all of those people were already vetted by Israel. It's, it's, it's a matter that we must keep in mind. And my final, and this is a critical comment about UNRWA, is that UNRWA has been for decades extremely careful, with very good reason, extremely careful to be non-political, to ensure that it doesn't make political statements, to ensure even that its staff members do not make political statements. For some reason, that changed after the 7th of October. UNRWA decided to, to issue a statement that criticized the Palestinian resistance for what happened on the 7th of October. Now, I'm not saying they should, they shouldn't. I'm just saying that the world seems to bend over backwards, including an organization like UNRWA, which has maintained a non-political stance for decades, would bend over backwards in order to give Israel exceptional treatment. It's time for that exceptional treatment to stop. And South Africa's two applications to the ICJ are attempts to say to the world community that it's time for Israel's impunity and Israel's impu uh, uh, immunity to be ended. And this is the beginning of that process. Thank you.